Welcome to the 3030 Health Podcast. The following discussion is for education and entertainment. It is not intended to diagnose or treat disease. Please do not apply any of this information without first discussing it with your doctor. Here is your host, Guillermo Ruiz. Hi, everyone. My guest today is Cristina Prieto. Cristina is a board-certified and licensed acupuncturist and founder of Harmony Wellness Center in Mainland, Florida. She studied at the Florida College of Integrative Medicine and in 2005 graduated with a Bachelor's Degree of Science in Natural Health Studies and a Master's of Science in Oriental Medicine. Christina received specialized training in acupuncture, Chinese, and Western herbs, and along the way, she even completed an internship in China at the Yantai Traditional Chinese Medicine Hospital, where she gathered a complete understanding of Chinese healing, which she consciously integrates into her patient care. Also, I get a lot of requests from my readers for strategies for healthy living. My friend Ellen Jaworski from Triple Pick Paleo wrote a guest post for my blog full of actionable strategies to live a healthier life while being productive during one of the most important times in the workday, lunch. You can read the blog on my website, 3030strong.com. I hope you enjoyed the show. Hello, everyone. I'm here with Christina. How are you? I am wonderful. Thank you for having me. Uh, so I've interviewed pretty big people, uh, like I have had Rob Wolf and I've had Dr. Alan Christensen, and you are the most elusive interview in the <laughs> in the history of my podcast because you're a world traveler, you have a busy practice, and it's so hard to pin you down. But finally, you know, I I think that the uh, alignment of the sun and the moon casting a shadow over the United States helped this happen. <laughs> How funny. You finally pinned me down, pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So Christina and, and uh, Terry, you know, Terry is like one of my dear friends from Orlando. And I love interviewing, you know, the people that form me because I stand on the shoulder of the, on the shoulders of giants. And I remember being in the hospital and Terry was working in the hospital with me and we would geek out on natural medicine in the middle of the allopathic sea. And, and you know, he really pushed me into filling out those applications for naturopathic medical school. And he really encouraged me to just, to say, just fuck it. You know, everything is going to be okay. Follow your passion. And I am so happy to have people like you guys that really encouraged me to, to really go and pursue this natural medicine. So I want to tell... Uh, my listeners, your story. What is your hero story? How do you go from being Christina to being the yogi and uh, an awesome world traveler and a healer? Oh, goodness. Well, let's cut back to 2002, uh, which is where I met Terry, was in acupuncture school. And way back, I thought I was going into the nursing scene. I said, okay, I, want, I knew I always wanted to be in the healthcare industry. I knew I wanted to help people, and that was just the most sensible way of doing it. I'll go to nursing school, maybe move on to nurse practitioner, and keep going from there. And so long story short, I started my degree in pre-nursing, and uh, my mom is a respiratory therapist. So she, I grew up with a parent in the Western medicine industry. And of course, I always looked up to her. Uh, but my mom was that mom that would, instead of taking us to the doctor, she'd give us handfuls of echinacea and vitamin <laughs> C and uña de gato and all kinds of stuff. So I, I think I, was, I grew up with both, um, both influences, the Western and the Eastern and so it took probably one or two trips to the hospital during clinicals to realize that nursing <laughs> was just not going to be what I was, you know, built for. Uh, I, I think more than anything, I got frustrated with the system. You know, I would see people in very, very, very ill conditions and they were hooked up to, you know, machines and, and there was chemical drips and there were, and I just thought to myself, what are these guys going to do when they get out and how do they not end up here again? 
and what caused them to be here in the first place. <laughs> so I went back to my dorm room. I must have been 20 years old. And I started researching natural healthcare careers, industries, options. And at the end of the day, acupuncture was like the thing. Chinese medicine was the thing that really just shook me to my core. It made sense to me. Um, and with little to no apprehension, I moved to Orlando. Where and from? I started, <laughs> well, from South Florida. So not too far. I had lived in Tallahassee, which is where I was studying. And uh, I moved to Orlando by myself and started acupuncture school. And I, I tell my patients all the time, I said, it's the best decision I ever made. And being part of the hero's journey is that it's one of those decisions where when you announce it, people say, what is that? And like, what are you going to do when you get out? And what do you mean? <laughs> and what kind of school is this? And so I just had to push through a lot of, you know, the the questions and, and people's judgments and things like that. And this was back when acupuncture was not in the mainstream at all. Um, I'll never forget being in school and Oprah was going to have acupuncture on her show. And we all got together and tuned in That's because... Awesome. <laughs> It was unheard of to see or hear of Chinese medicine in, you know, in the mainstream. It was very, very, you know, unusual. So for my listeners out there, you know, uh, let's divide what traditional Chinese medicine is, TCM. I want to make clear that the TCM is a whole system of healthcare. It's not just needles. It, you know, it encompasses you know, the needling aspect of things, which is a fraction of the whole picture of traditional uh, Chinese medicine. We There is a lot of botanical medicine, you know, within TCM, and there is like a big emphasis on nutrition too. Absolutely. But, you know, whenever we think about acupuncture, we think either two things. We think of needles or we think of Michael Phelps during the Olympics with all of the bruises from uh, cupping. How do you explain traditional Chinese medicines to someone that you, know, that you just met at a party? You're absolutely right. It is thought of as, and, and we also call ourselves acupuncturists. So of course, what we do is acupuncture and we just put needles in people all day. Uh, but an acupuncturist licensed and board certified has um, has a has an understanding of the the what we call differential diagnosis as according to Chinese medicine. And once we pull together a diagnosis through, of course, questions, um, observing the patient, looking at their tongue, looking at their pulse, looking at their eyes, the color of their skin, the way that they talk, all these uh, different pieces of information that we can pull from, the nature of the patient, we funnel it down to an imbalance that they may have. And so depending on the diagnosis that they may have, it may be indicated that they need to change their diet. So diet therapy is a biggie. Uh, we may or may not do body work, including cupping, gua sha, tui na, and um, gua sha is the, the skin scraping. One of my favorite and, tools. <laughs> oh yeah, it's fabulous. I'm big on cupping. I cup um, almost all of my patients. And then, of course, acupuncture. But there's times where patients come in and I say, you know what? What you need is really a foundation in a, in a diet change and to integrate these, these botanicals, these herb, herbal formulas. And then, you know what? Once you've got a grip, then maybe we do some acupuncture to, as an adjunct. So, so yeah, Chinese medicine has several different branches that we can utilize to help with the whole of the person. And, and it's so interesting because when we think of acupuncture, I, at least, you know, in my, it, it, it's, it's a little bit more widespread over here in the West, you know, in Phoenix. Uh, when I was in, uh, in Orlando, my first experience with acupuncture was uh, at a job and one of my friends wanted to quit smoking. 
So he went to an acupuncturist and they did the NADA protocol to help him, you know, uh, quit smoking. What are some of the conditions that you can treat with acupuncture? The ones that we can treat are vast. Yeah, vast. <laughs> everything. Uh, <laughs> uh, almost everything. Uh, I'll tell you the ones that I treat the most, and that's going to be uh, fertility, because that's my personal uh, my personal love and heart is in helping women conceive. The other one is going to be pain. So pain in uh, lower back pain, neck pain, knee pain, migraines, all kinds of pain, tendinitis, bursitis, sciatica. Um, I have a couple of spinal cord injuries and things like that. We treat a lot of allergies and digestive issues. Such a funny story because, like, I remember when uh, when uh, Terry was talking about being an acupuncturist, and he was practicing a little bit and being a nurse, and you know, and he told me that he like resonated with like allergies, and he was like really good at the you know LA twenty two V tongue and you know things like that, and then. Uh, like every once in a while, uh, you were you were so swamped, and uh, an, a fertility patient needed treatment, and he would do the treatment, and it wouldn't be as restorative as when you did it. <laughs> so you know, it's like it, it, you know, even within you know my training, uh, you get trained in cardiovascular, and you get trained in uh, in every single uh, system in the body, but you resonate or you uh, you actually perform better at things that you really are passionate about. And that isn't that is so, fascinating? Isn't that yeah. fascinating? And, and, and especially when you're using uh, these ancient methods of, of medicine, what's the story of, of like traditional Chinese medicine? How did it come about? Well, there's a lot of different theories because it's so, so old. I mean, some dates go back to 4,000 years, some dates go back to 2,500 years. And um, where we pull from are the ancient sages that I think the biggest um, catalyst in, in the way that this philosophy was born is that there were very enlightened beings that would observe nature and then they would observe the human body and they would see how nature and the human body behaved similarly. And that's where in Chinese medicine, we get these, these pathogens known as heat and cold and wind and dampness. Because you can imagine back then, there was no blood work, there were no x-rays or MRIs or anything like that. So they would have to do a lot of really intuitive work. And um, you know, one simple example is, let's say, that somebody has um, chills or seizures. And that's something that we would call wind, wind invasion. And so what happens when the wind blows really intensely and the trees, they shake really fast and it's a sudden onset and um, it kind of leaves a mess and it may drop down some trees. And so they would see, oh, this person who maybe is having um, a seizure or a Bell's palsy or has chills, they must have wind invasion. And I think, I think over time, just with a lot of trial and error, they developed a system of, of diagnostics and of uh, known pathogens. And I think they did a lot of observing <laughs> back then. Not only observing, but also, uh, like you said, trial and error when it comes to what prescription uh, botanicals uh, and then on top of that you know you know what acupuncture points and also uh, what uh, healthy habits to follow and this is like one of my favorite examples is like the nomenclature of wind invasion is what they had to explain the disease processes uh, for example, dampness, you know, you know, in, in, in our very narrow minded Western philo uh, way of looking at things, you know, you think of damp and you think of a sponge. But in traditional Chinese medicine, you know, OK, they talk about dampness and you talk about phlegm and how eating a sugary diet or a cold diet, you know, that that doesn't provide any heat can uh, uh, take you to this dampness uh, path and the way to 
control that dampness is by eating a different diet. So maybe the nomenclature is not the most scientific, but the reasoning behind the the way the, the diet is prescribed and the, the, the way that uh, herbs are prescribed, it's pretty sound. Absolutely. And, and going back to that wind invasion example, so here's a patient that has these symptoms. Okay, well, how do we treat these symptoms? Uh, perhaps some root botanicals, some things that don't move when the wind blows. Let's find a plant that is very stable when there's a storm and see what we can we can use for teas or your tinctures from that from that particular plant or somebody that has blood deficiencies, which what we would maybe call anemia, B12 deficiency. Let's choose some foods that look like blood. You know, now beets have have tons of iron and it looks like a little uterus. And so for, and, and it goes on and on. So we don't, we don't really look at macros and, and, and grams of sugar or, or things like that. It really is the most basic of, of explanations and all the sciencey stuff has come about recently. Yeah. In the past, what, hundred years? Of course. I mean, look at a walnut. You crack open the shell of a walnut and it looks like a little brain. And and the Chinese knew these this thousands of years ago that these good fats were good for memory. And, you know, then we come around and we publish an article in the <laughs> Yoga Journal magazine and that says uh, eat walnuts for good memory. Uh, but this is something that, that they knew thousands of years ago just through the observation of nature and how it relates to the human anatomy, the human body, the human behaviors. and So you finished your acupuncture training, and then you decided to travel the world. <laughs> well, that not without building a practice first. Because, <laughs> see, in order to travel, you got to have, you know, some, some funds and some, <laughs> some stability. And, uh, and so when I graduated from school, I started a practice, but I didn't, start traveling quite, you know, quite at the beginning. Now, was that always like the dream? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, uh, I just graduated from uh, naturopathic medical school and uh, a lot of people within naturopathic in, in any healthcare system, uh, that's like the dream, you know, they, you know, you have this like drive not only to help your community, but go around the world and help everyone. What is the recipe? How the how were you able to achieve this? I think looking back, I started a practice, you know, with with bells and 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 rockets under my feet, and I just went a thousand percent full force. Um, I was the person at the festivals with the table set up to educate people and going to corporate events and having, and I just really got myself out there fast. In fact, I had a, I had a space rented at a chiropractor's office before I even graduated. Cause I said, as soon as I get my license, you know, this is it. And so the, you know, the rest is history. I really gave it my all little by little. I grew my practice. Um, and eventually several years, I think maybe, let's see, maybe five years into my practice, the intention was always to have a practice that I could pluck myself out of, and it would be like a well-oiled machine and it would keep going even if I was not in the mix. And, uh, with that intention, I made sure that I had incredible staff, which I'm so lucky that I do. I have uh, not, I'm not the only acupuncturist at my practice. So I always had um, other acupuncturists that would be able to serve our patients. And uh, I'll never forget the first time I went on a probably like a two and a half week trip to South America. And I said, one of two things are going to happen. I'm either never leaving again, or this is going to be it. And I've cracked a code. <laughs> so how many countries have you visited? Oh man, you know I have a I have a map here in my office with little pins and dots of all the places I've been. I wish I had a number for you, but I've been to of course my heart is in Asia, so I've been to India and China and Nepal and I'm actually going to Indonesia in November. I've been to Peru and Cuba and Costa Rica and I just love going to places where I can reconnect with 
with nature. And and not only do you do you travel to all these amazing places, sometimes you go by yourself. Oh yeah. <laughs> Because and I'll tell you why. There is nothing more more fulfilling to my spirit and my heart than to be in the middle of nowhere with just my backpack and and little to no connection to, you know, technology and things like that because when I am home and I am at my practice, it is it is 100% service. And I'm I'm really present. My intention is to always be 100% present with my patients. And so I think as a as a practitioner, you have to carve out that time to recharge your own batteries or there's a very quick burnout rate that can, <laughs> you know, that can happen fast. And I've tiptoed into those little corners where I, you know, I think to myself, I really need to to self care. And for me, it's going to a very, very far away place. <laughs> for a substantial amount of time. So tell me, uh, why do you love Asia so much? Why India? I love the simplicity and the, the, the colorful cultures. I mean, you go to India and it is just, well, it's the most impoverished place I've ever seen, but it's also the most colorful culture and a lively culture and I think the spirituality there and the devotion that you see just even in the streets and um, even the food's very flavorful. And I've been attracted to the Asian cultures, I think, since I was a kid. Hence, becoming an acupuncturist just out of pure being guided by my heart to to do this medicine. There's something I think deeper than just a conscious decision to become an acupuncturist. It was something in my heart that really guided me in that direction. And, uh, and when I go to Asia, I just feel, I don't know, I just feel like the history is so old and so rich. Do you practice in Ayur Ayurvedic medicine? I do not. I do not. I have um, just very like tiptoed in it for my own personal, sometimes Because I'm an acupuncturist, I use acupuncture personally. I use Chinese herbs personally. Uh, and I found that for my own uh, health program, it was, it was nice to go to a completely different philosophy and have somebody work with me in, in something I just didn't know really much of so that I can kind of get out of my own way and all, all of the things that I knew already. So when I, when I learned about Ayurveda for my own personal just health maintenance and wellness, it was incredible to see how the Chinese medicine and, and Ayurvedic medicine is just, they're like, they're more like sisters than cousins. They're so, so similar. Can you talk a little bit about that? When did you decide to, that you needed that, that outside perspective looking in? I think I just was feeling a little bit burnt out. And there was uh, a woman in, in my community that, uh, that I knew who had studied Ayurveda. And I said, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at my health picture, which was not, gratefully, was not bad. Um, it was just not optimal. Mm. Yeah, it's like that, that hunger for 100% health. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's there. It's there. And I said, I'm going to just be a complete um, vessel and I'm going to show up and I'm going to do what they tell me and I'm going to let them assess me. And it's almost like uh, like talking in a different language rather than in my own language <laughs> where I can get in my own way. So um, so it, it was very fruitful. That was a, a stage in my life that that I went through. And through that, I learned, you know, a little bit about Ayurvedic but nothing that um, that I integrate into my practice at all. I'm very much try to stick to the traditional Chinese medicine philosophies. And where does the uh, yoga come in? Oh, that's just my, I'm just such a yoga junkie. <laughs> When you started your yoga, uh, your yoga adventures, was, was, was this before uh, acupuncture school? No. I finished acupuncture school, started a practice, and started working out with a personal trainer who is now a really great friend of mine. She took me to my first yoga class, and I 
went into the studio and the teacher said, okay, well, you can pay after class and just go in and lay down your mat. And I took the class and it was probably one of the hardest things I'd ever done (laughs) physically. And I finished the class and I went to pay and I said, I would like a 10 pack, please. (laughs) (laughs) I felt something shifting in my body that I knew that I needed in my life. And that's the addiction was born. I mean, instant addiction to, uh, to a yoga practice. And it's been what has, has carried me through. I mean, I just don't know where I'd be without my yoga practice. Can yoga be like restorative? You know, it, it, it's like, it, I'm trying to compare it to like CrossFit, you know, like, it, you know, CrossFit just breaks you down. Uh, of course, you know, there is a chance to, uh, to build muscle, but if you do it wrong, it can be pretty damaging. Uh, wh- what are the benefits of yoga and, and should everyone do, uh, you know, yoga? I think yoga in the West is this catch-all term for a lot of different possibilities. You could have very restorative yoga where you don't even break a sweat. It's just mostly breathing and doing a few postures. And then you have this other extreme with the hot power flow that is very intense and and a lot of movement and, you know, you leave there drenched. So I think that the different styles of yoga can suit different people in their own way. Um, It's one of the exercises that I have found that really truly doesn't steal from you. It doesn't break apart your tissues and need, you know, for rebuilt in order to have it rebuilt. It doesn't wear and tear on the joints. It is generally one does not leave a yoga class exhausted and drained and you feel invigorated. You feel like your body is, is open and free and oxygenated. Uh, There's, you know, yoga can serve, I think, different people in different ways. Do you, do you think that, uh, that we've messed up yoga like us Westerners? Uh, do you think that, uh, that we've taken it too far? Yeah. (laughs) a short, a short little snippet of my, of my career is that I did, uh, get certified to become a yoga teacher. And so I became a yoga teacher and I started teaching yoga and I opened up a yoga studio and it was, it was an extension of the wellness center that I have here where I practice acupuncture. And I ran a yoga studio for almost four years in which in that fourth, in that third and a half year, I went to India and I go to India and I realize that the business of yoga just isn't what I wanted to be doing. (laughs) It just felt like a, a really bad version of the tradition of, of yoga was to have this sense of a yoga studio and to take, you know, payment and to have music and all this fancy business with the, and the, the Instagram page for the yoga, where really this practice is an internal experience and a sacred experience. And we really, in the West, have, you know, the fancy clothes and the pretty mats. And, and it's, it's okay. I still go to yoga studios and I still have fun doing yoga. Uh, but the things you're seeing now with these, uh, let's say, yoga at the brewing, uh, at the beer companies where you do yoga and then you have beer or, uh, you know, things like that are just, I think, sort of diluting the sacredness of the practice and the health benefits of the practice. And we leave out the good stuff. We leave out the breath work. We leave out the chanting. We leave out, you know, a lot of the uh, meditation aspects of a yoga practice. You know, it's like we we are so uncomfortable with those uh, with those practices, especially like meditation and uh, and breathing, and that it's easier just to cut them out. And add in a level of uh, stress, like, you know, making it hot or having this, uh, this unbelievable positions and trying to get to those positions as fast as possible, because now you can do, you know, a handstand or whatever that, uh, that in reality, 
how long do you think those those like expert positions? How long do you think a a yoga traditional yoga instructor? Uh, how long does it take in order for a person to do those complicated positions? Well, back to how we treat yoga in the West. I think how we do anything is how we do everything. Yeah, and you're <laughs> exactly, and you're absolutely right. You know, let's take a you know a, a healthy cultural thing and 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 ter- make it Western and and dilute it. And <laughs> my teachers taught me that you are a beginner for the first ten years of your yoga practice. And um, that's the humility, obviously, reflected in in the teacher. But I've I've been practicing, let me think, 2006, so almost 10 years, or 11 years, actually. And I very much feel like a beginner. And my yoga practice has has kind of turned from a little bit more invigorated and power and, you know, a little bit excitable to more of a restorative practice. And to say that, there's a level to achieve, for example, for a yoga teacher to achieve a certain posture, to achieve a certain um, form is, is kind of impossible because we're all on our own personal journey. Whether you're taking it slow or whether you're taking it fast, it's still your own personal um, experience. You know, it's, it, it like reminds me of like, like the movie The Karate Kid. <laughs> where you know uh the 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 uh the 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 bad dudes are like getting uh belts and they are breaking boards and then Daniel San is <laughs> waxing a car and and he doesn't understand the you know the the reasoning behind it spoiler alert it's uh it lets him beat the bad guy you know because it's it, it's all about the process it's about the fundamentals and it's silly that we have this western expectation of grading or or rungs or like levels that we have to achieve and we are not doing anything for the journey we're doing things for the destination and uh yes the destination is awesome but how did you get there in in what made you prepared to achieve that destination. And if we look, we can look at anything like that. You know, we can look at health and uh, yeah, sure, you want to get healthy, but what have you, how have you grown as a human being from eating like a shitty diet and then understanding the, the physiology or the tradition or the evidence or the spiritual uh, nature of why we eat this way? In having that knowledge and being able to apply this knowledge when someone asks you, how come you're not eating pizza, dude? And being able to answer, you know, not because, oh, I read a book or I, uh, you know, or I read a post on Facebook that told me not to eat pizza. No, you have an understanding. And it's like Zen to be able to have that journey where uh, like habits that truly stick are going to be the ones that really have an impact in your life. Not just, you know, uh, oh, I paid, I I went to 12 different sessions and I went to the one hour seminar and now I have a a, a certificate. (laughs) Right. One of my, one of my favorite yoga teachers, his name is Max Strom. He says, yoga is not about getting your foot behind your head. It's about all the things you learn while trying. (laughs) It's like, you know, it's, it's a process and it's a journey and it's um, much like, like acupuncture or, or a healing, you know, process being sick to healthy, it is, is a journey and you learn so much along the way. And, you know, maybe you're not to the point where you're 25 again, or you have that level of energy, but you're, you're working towards that. And all of the things you learn along the way are invaluable. And, you know, to take it back to traditional Chinese medicine, uh, and, and I like to make this this assertion or, or make sure that people understand that the power is not on the needle. You know, it's not about putting 50 or 80 needles in your body and that's what's going to heal you. It's about the whole system. It's about your understanding of your physiology 
and your understanding of how to balance and in uh, the understanding of like everything that, that has actions, you know, like for example, in traditional Chinese medicine, we were talking about the importance of drinking pure water and, and breathing pure air. And now it's like, you know, this is like 2,500, 2,500 years ago or, or you know, uh, 4,000 years ago that they were talking about this stuff. And now uh, we talk about it like it's like the newest thing. You got to learn how to breathe. Dude, the Chinese have been doing this for so long. Right. And the yogis. <laughs> and the yogis too. Yeah. In any system of medicine, that you know, any system of traditional medicine has a couple of things. They, they, they all have a couple of things in common. You know, they have meditation, whether it's like in the form of prayer or in the form of meditation uh, or yoga or walking or whatever. Qigong, they have uh, uh, fasting. You know, how many cultures, you know, the, you know, in the Indian culture, there's fasting. Even in Christianity, there is fasting. And, and uh, you know, and now you look at a journal and they talk about, like, the benefits of ketones in your, uh, in your brain. You can look at any religious text and they talk about how having this fasting gave you more clarity. So it's so ingrained in our DNA to have these practices, whether it's fasting, whether it's like stretching, uh, whether it's having a healthy diet. All of this is part of being a healthy human. And to think that we can somehow hack it or shortcut it or, you know, uh, by paying a subscription or by not putting in the time, it's kind of silly. I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> and I think the difference with these these ancient thought forms and philosophies is that they didn't have all of the choices that we have. You know, eating healthy was the norm because they didn't have processed food and this <laughs> industrialized, you know, fast food uh, drive throughs and things like that. Um, meditation maybe was a little bit easier to achieve when you didn't have these high demand jobs and these desk jobs where your energy is drained and you have no connection to the outside world. Uh, there's so much that we have to undo as the, in the, in the way that we live this, this life it, nowadays. Um, whereas for, let's say back, back when it was just part of their normal living conditions. It, it's hard to it, meditate when uh, Game of Thrones is on. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, it, it's it, like technology sometimes, you know, I love technology. It's so super important, but it does get in the way of health. So tell me, what are you doing to help other people find these paradises, find, you know, extract themselves from technology and from uh, stress and really like connect with these traditional forms of uh, meditation or yoga or just health? Well, one of the one of the things that just happens organically in in my day to day is during an acupuncture treatment, my patients do not have their phones on them. The phones are silenced. They're in a dim lit room by themselves or if I'm in there treating them. But a lot of times I leave the room and let them what I call simmer, let them simmer in there with the needles. You would not believe how how much just that creates a shift in in the nervous system and their the benefits of their health overall. Um, you know, on a bigger scale, I have started in the last like two years taking groups of people overseas to I've done three trips to Cuba and one to Costa Rica and uh, going to places that are the most simple living that you can imagine and uh, and filled with nature and just stillness. I mean, in Cuba, they don't have Wi-Fi. There was no Wi-Fi. There was <laughs> zero Wi-Fi. <laughs> Um, if you wanted to meet somebody for dinner, you'd have to meet at the lamppost at six o'clock and hope that you both made it there. Uh, it was very, very old school, uh, which is refreshing. It's so, so refreshing to go back to looking each other in the face and being present with one another over a meal. And Costa Rica, we had a group just last week. Uh, we stayed in a, in a, it was not a remote village, but it was close to. 
and we did all kinds of stuff in these. I mean, we went paddle boarding in the mangroves and we went zip lining in the, the rainforest and to these beautiful, beautiful, untouched beaches. And I think that taking and carving out, whether it's an hour a day or a few hours a week, or whether it's carving out an entire one or two weeks, that it is so important to really drop all the all the stuff and and get back to present moment awareness and, and reconnect with each other and reconnect with nature because you can do all the acupuncture in the world. But if we are running around with our heads cut off and just burning it at both ends, there's not a huge shift, I think, that can be made. And so my passion is that it's just showing people how to get back to, to the basics and to present moment awareness. If it means they're in a, in, in their acupuncture treatment table, or if they're, you know, hanging off a tree, zip lining in Costa Rica. <laughs> so what's your Cuban connection? Oh, what's my Cuban connection? My parents are Cuban. <laughs> <laughs> my parents are Cuban and, uh, I said to myself, I've been to China and India and, and I can't go to Cuba. I really want to see where my family is from. And so long story short, I, I pulled it off and I went to Cuba alone first. I went on my own just to kind of scope things out. Do you still have family down there? I don't. I don't. Over the years, if I do, they're distant relatives and I don't know them. But over the years from after the revolution in like 60, 62, my grandparents came over with small kids who would meet in Miami and become my parents. And, uh, over the years, you know, they've, all of my distant relatives have, have made it over here. And, um, gratefully I have all of the luxuries in the world because of them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, cause I can't imagine because I, we had a conversation a couple of months ago and I asked you, where can you get the best Cuban food? And you said, Miami, <laughs> <laughs> you, you go to Miami to Versailles and, and uh, that's where you can get the best vaca frita in the planet. Uh, because no matter what in Cuba, they are still suffering. Absolutely. I, I, I think I, I feel bad saying they're suffering. Because Cuban people are the most resourceful individuals in the planet. You know, you, you Cuban pork is magic. And it's made <laughs> with a couple of spices. I can name them. Garlic, some olive oil, a little bit of onion, and oregano. And if you're from uh, uh, outside of Havana, you don't put cumin on your pork. <laughs> <laughs> you nailed it. Yeah. And, and that's it. And you roast it and you make it with love and it's amazing. And it's one of the most delicious things you can eat. Yeah, and you and you go there and you see that that the Cubans are even with all of their hardships and all of the, you know, political turmoil and and, and they're they have a brightness in their eyes and they are present with you when you you know, when you talk to them and you know, I came across a musician and I, I, he showed me his drum and his drum was so old that, of course, the top leather section had been beat to, to a pulp and didn't exist. And so he had built with an, uh, an x-ray film. He built his drum. The top of it was an old x-ray film. And that's what he used to create his music. Uh, there was a day that we were having um, some cocktails, some some Cuba Libres. And so we didn't have enough cups for all of the people that were there. But somebody had a water bottle. And we were trying to pour the Coke into the top of the water bottle, which is very small. And the Cuban guy, he goes, wait, 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 let me. And he used his, his little pocket knife and he cut the a Zephyr Hills bottle in half and made two cups out of it. You know, wide mouth <laughs> yeah. cups. And that's what we drank, you know, overlooking the ocean. And, and and I just thought to myself, that would have never have occurred to me. <laughs> <laughs> but they are just, they're so incredibly resourceful. And, you know, there's, if you want to talk about reduce, reuse, and recycle, go to these kind of places where it's not a trend, it's life. Yeah, you, you we think about like the Nordic states, you know, like Sweden and Norway being able to, you know, to have like these facilities that can sort all these materials. 
talk about having a 1940s car still running <laughs> when there are no parts. You know, they are they are fabricating parts because that's their livelihood. Uh, how can you experience this society or how can, you know, what is the best way to immerse yourself into the real Cuba? Well, when I do these trips overseas, I go as a yoga retreat and, um, you know, I, I tell the, the people that come with me, sometimes they're yogis, sometimes they've never really done yoga, but they're very much open to it. And one of my, my biggest um, intentions is, guys, you know, we're here on a yoga retreat, but it's not about the fancy postures and getting, you know, into these physical forms. The yoga is in how we immerse ourselves into this culture with, with an open heart, with present moment awareness, with mindfulness. And we're bringing those yogic qualities into everything that we do while we're here. Um, and that is, that is, has been my intention with each of the groups that I have brought um, overseas is taking that yoga off the mat and really bringing it into, into every interaction and into every activity that we do overseas. Is, is there a strong natural medicine movement in Cuba? Oh, you would not believe. Yes. And again, it stems out of resourcefulness. It's funny because Cuba has some of the best doctors in the world. Yeah. And and to imagine that, you know, like, so I, I really thought that was like that you were going to say, well, really not, you know, like their their medicine is pretty modern. But talk, talk about this, like um, uh, natural medicine movement. Well, what what is kind of sad is that, yes, they do have incredible education and they are known to have some of the best doctors in the world. But still, a lot of the Cuban um, people cannot get medical care out of uh, some, you know, since the medical care is is socialized, sometimes you have to wait months to see a doctor. And um, there were times where there was no access, like right after the revolution, there was just no access to medical care. They had uh, actually, was it in the 90s? where the crash of the Soviet Union just kind of did away with, with all of their resources. And there, that was a time where my yoga teacher in Cuba, he, um, he shares this with me. He said that that's when yoga and natural medicine became very, very popular because people had to take their own health into their own hands. And alternative medicine became, became very popular. And yoga specifically. Really? What about like herbal medicine? Is there is there a tradition of herbal medicine, or did you or did have you not experienced that? I did not get to experience the medicinal aspect of like herbal medicine. I did tour a lot of farms, and we went out into the countryside, where what you see is a lot of um, herbal like herbs, plant herbs, and um, like noni fruit and all kinds of of high antioxidant fruits and vegetables that are grown completely 100% organic. They're so unbelievable with their farming out of necessity. They just didn't have access to chemicals, so they had to figure it out. And, uh, and they're known globally for their farming methods and, and techniques and organic and sustainable farming specifically. Because it's an island. It's an island, and they had to make do. <laughs> do you see a lot of similarities between Cuba and India? Not really. I think Cuba has been so isolated from from U.S. influence. And even a lot of U.S. companies, like you go to India, and there will be a McDonald's, and there will be a, a Pizza Hut. And in Cuba, there's not, there's no billboards, there's no... Um, uh, products that that come from the United States. There's no influence from the U.S. Whereas in India, um, you do have that, and you see it infiltrated into their into their culture. Believe it or not, I, I can't imagine like the juxtaposition of like seeing like this temples and this you know uh, all of this uh, you know people that have been doing this traditional stuff for thousands and thousands of years. And then iPhones. Like, I, I, I can't <laughs> imagine. Like, I, I bet that's insane. Oh, what's funny is to be in the Himalayas in Nepal 
at a monastery and see like five little monks huddled together all looking at one phone because one monk scored a phone somewhere <laughs> along the way and they're all huddled looking at it. Um, but technology is reaching further and further and Cuba just got their Wi-Fi towers a couple of years ago. And how do you know where the Wi-Fi connection is? Because you see about a hundred people <laughs> all huddled together in one area looking at their phones and uh it's it's interesting it's really interesting to see you know how that may unfold for them and um it's great to be connected you can't deny that i think everything like we preach in chinese medicine uh it's all about balance so uh what about uh so in india so uh, have you have you taken a group of people to india because india scares me like cuba doesn't scare me <laughs> India, for some reason, is like daunting. India is tough. India is tough. I have not taken a group of people to India, and I don't plan on doing that quite yet. Maybe after a few more uh, test runs in a little bit simpler places. Um, India is chaotic and crazy and beautiful and, you know, very unsanitary, very unsanitary, unfortunately. Uh, very impoverished and and very beautiful, all in one crazy package. So, like I imagine, like New York City, you know, like when if you describe New York, New York City is like dirty and glamorous and loud and always on, and you know, but like imagine that that times ten, you know, at the complete other extremes. You know, you have this beautiful temple with gold-plated, you know, deities. And in order to get there, you have to pass, you know, people begging and women with babies and empty baby bottles. And uh, it's just so, such a dichotomy that it really is an insult to your senses. Uh, and, and you know, the, the humility that I get as an American traveling to those places is just profound. I mean, some of my biggest personal growth and spiritual growth have been from from going to places outside of the US and seeing how other cultures live the good the bad the ugly the all of it how do you how do you stay centered in you know because you do see a lot of people uh, on on like the interwebs talking about like how we are you know whitewashing you know by you know going over there and, and to impoverished countries and how do you how do you how do you center yourself and how do you remain honest to yourself whenever you visit places like India places like Cuba so you're not being you know uh, like a, like a savior you know you are like really in, in taking in the culture and trying to respect it to the max. Well, I think my yoga practice has really helped me, has helped me be able to deal with whatever I encounter, no matter what that might be, uh, whether it's the Taj Mahal and the beauty of the Himalayas and the little sloth that was in the tree in Costa Rica, which is, or the very depressing, very sad, you know, sometimes, um, very disturbing things that you might see staying centered, I think is about staying present. And unless there is some level of, of practice for me, it's, it's yoga and meditation and being out in nature, paddleboarding, you know, being centered, uh, Without that, I think people can be derailed very easily traveling overseas to places that, you know, can be so, so uncomfortable and such, like I said, an insult to your senses. Not only that, but being physically uncomfortable. There's no AC in a lot of these places. You're in cars that are just very poor conditions. The roads are horrible. Uh, you don't know the language. I mean, it's all kinds of uncomfortable. But I think that's the beauty in in the experience, such as when we do a fast or when you have to drink a tea that tastes like, you know, dirty toes or <laughs> it's it, we have to be able to endure, I think, certain levels of discomfort in order to be uh, to be able to tolerate, you know, when our environment gets 
gets a little a little hairy you know we have that that sort of ninja you know resistance the old you know these chinese martial artists they beat themselves with rocks and they put themselves through really uncomfortable things why so when they get into a fight or when they get into you know their 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 matches they're able to withstand the the impact and the hits and the and i don't think life you know life can can pummel us so sometimes we have to pummel ourselves a little bit so we can tolerate <laughs> life's pummeling have you have you ever uh, you know in like what i'm trying to get to is like uh like people uh doing like ayahuasca trips you know like the tourism of ayahuasca and like in peruvian culture there's other herbs that are more powerful than ayahuasca but we americans want to hallucinate and we think it's so neat to be doing <laughs> these things that we have depreciated the like you said you know like with yoga the art and the tradition and you know uh in the in in all of that you know sacredness of the ritual how do you keep honest to yourself so you don't do the same mistakes do you, that you when you go visit over there you are as true to the culture without you know being just a tourist that wants to take a picture in front of the Taj Mahal oh goodness well i think sometimes you do kind of get sucked into the baby alpaca in Peru that, you know, you have to tip the person in order to take the picture with the baby alpaca. And, you know, I, I did that too. <laughs> uh, I think education is probably your biggest um, resource against being, being sucked into being too much of a, of a tourist and not enough of a traveler. And that's something that, that I always try to work on is how can I be here Um, as an observer, as, 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 as honest to myself as I can be, not being so much of a tourist, but more of a traveler. And I think there's a big difference. So I think your intention is your biggest, your, your, the biggest way that, that one can steer clear of being, uh, you know, part of the disease and not part of the cure when you go to these you know, type of places, like taking a picture with, with an, a little animal. The alpaca wasn't drugged, but sometimes they drug these like little, you know, baby tigers and stuff. And so, you know, you try not to participate in things that, that, you know, are not, are not really high vibe. And yeah, because a lot of times, you know, like, uh, uh, we, we like to do all these trips, uh, or these adventures, And uh, more and more, I'm noticing that it's it's like like going to the concert just for the T-shirt to you, so you can <laughs> say that you were there rather than enjoying the experience of sharing the sounds that your favorite artist is making on stage. And, and being able to maintain that clarity, you know, when your senses are being assaulted, you know, I, I bet it's like pretty nerve wracking. Now... The last trip you did was to Costa Rica. Why Costa Rica? Terry and I went. We had hit 10 years, believe it or not, together in December. And uh, I had been following on social media a couple that moved to Costa Rica. They were American. They moved to Costa Rica. And they built a beautiful, beautiful lodge uh, named Manoa's over there with villas and these beautiful glamping tents overlooking the rainforest. And so Terry and I said, you know, let's do a little trip. And we went out there and it was um, it was pretty much off the beaten path. And we, we just fell madly in love with the place. And so the entire time I was there, I had I had a little a little stray eye checking out some some spots for a yoga retreat. And when I came back, I built a, a retreat and uh, and luckily I filled it and we We stayed on this beautiful property and had like daily excursions and and did yoga every day and um, stayed in the rainforest with, I mean, just the howler monkeys and the beautiful birds and just a full immersion and using the local Costa Rican, you know, companies that that took us on these excursions, local tour guides. Uh, we had a chef that was this incredible woman that cooked for us daily 
And so, you know, supporting the local economy in these places is also a really great way to give back and to get a true experience of of the the culture that you're in. Yeah, getting the the pura vida experience. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you know, in so what's your next uh, excursion? Uh, are you planning any other uh, like personal trips, or you are you planning any uh, retreats? Well, I just got back last week from the one in Costa Rica. And I have a very vague uh, one. It's just in the brainstorming stages to Bali, Indonesia. Oh man! Yeah. So I'm going in November, and uh, are you going solo? It out. I'm going with my mom actually. Oh, she cool. Tur- yeah, she has a milestone birthday, and so we're ma- we're doing an epic adventure overseas. We're going to Bali, and I'm gonna have that little little third eye just scoping things out on the side and possibly built uh build a yoga retreat and and execute that one it's not india but it's pretty far away it's pretty far and, and it's <laughs> uh it's in the middle of nowhere <laughs> exactly that's, that's the whole point <laughs> so christina how can people follow your adventures where can people uh see you as a patient or uh follow you on instagram and uh and if they maybe if they're interested in this like natural retreat, uh, you know, I, I want to call it like holistic yoga, you know, not your Lulu yoga. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, but more of like uh, this restorative yoga. How can people get a hold of you? Well, Instagram's always a fun way to connect. And what's your handle? It is Yogini C to the P. <laughs> Yogini C to the P. And uh, my website is HarmonyWellnessCenter.com. And, of course, I'm on Facebook under Christina Prieto. I'm going to have all of these uh, 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 websites and, and handles and, uh, you know, all of that stuff uh, on, my, on the show notes for this show. And, you know, like I've been following you, you know, like as friends and, you know, like super jelly of all the stuff that you do because <laughs> – It really takes balls, you know, uh, like because from the moment that, you know, I, I've met you, you've always been on the go doing what you want to do. You know, no, it's, you know, you built a su- successful practice and then you had that successful yoga studio and then you introspectively said, this is not my dream. You know, your dream was to be true to the yoga and uh, and you continue, you know, adding uh, pins to your map And, and, you know, so it's so, it's so exciting that, that anyone out there that has this dream of being a healer and has this dream of visiting the world, which, you know, it's a lot of people out there want to do both things and you're like actually living the dream. So it's super amazing. Oh, thank you so much. So I, you know, like. Maybe next time uh, you go to n- just on your retreat, maybe you can uh, just shoot me an email or tag me on it, and I'll put it on my website so everyone can know that you're planning it. And uh, and I hope you have a lot of fun in Bali. Thank you. Thank so, you. Thank you so much for having me, and I really enjoyed our conversation. Oh man, it, it, you know, and and, th- and this is not. So uh, at the beginning of the show, I said that uh, the 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 sun and the moon aligning. Today is the eclipse day. Like literally, like today the moon and the sun aligned, and I think that's why we're having this conversation. So we're not gonna wait a hundred years before we have another conversation. We're gonna have Deal. you. We're gonna have you again, and uh, and and maybe we can ask some questions for uh you know on Facebook, and maybe people can submit their questions, and maybe we can answer them. Whether it's about traveling or health or infertility or, you know, uh, pain, you know, you name it. Maybe we can do a Facebook Live or something. That would be a blast. Wouldn't it? I'm game. Awesome. I'm game. (laughs) Christina, thank you so much for being on the show and I will talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.